Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined, as always, in studio today by President Wyatt. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Steve. It's nice to be with you again today. We're joined in studio today by one of my very favorite people here at SUU. I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce her, but we're going to talk about the importance of knowing who we are as individuals and as an organization and the stories that we use to remind ourselves who we are. Who is our guest this morning? So we have Vice President Mindy Benson. And uh, Mindy, welcome. Thanks for having me here. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. So we've had uh, a lot of fun over the past years talking about stories. And uh, tell us uh, when you became really interested in stories. I have always loved stories. My family are a group of storytelling people, and it's been passed down for generations, and they've always been important to the identity of who we are, and you can always get a laugh of stories from my brothers. But as I was getting my communications master's degree, I learned quite a few things about stories and terms and communication theories about stories and why they're important and how they're passed on. And it became uh, an, really an obsession with me that it's an important part of communication and it helps us shape our identity and our narrative so people buy into the same things that we, we are because it's a shared culture. Does your, does your family, you talked about loving stories as a child and I think that we probably all loved cho- stories when we were children. But is there a story that particularly defined your family or helped you create some kind of an identity? Oh, we had stories of, of course, like everyone, my family came across from England and Wales, and we had stories about them and the hardships that they endured and how that helps us get through anything. There was one particular story about my great-grandfather, who, as a child coming across the plains, got sick and was left to be raised by Native Americans, and how our cultures intermix, and it just became the hero story of why we do what we do and if he could survive that and grow with great people then all of us could do the same so through that kind of a story your family developed an identity and um, a character right It, it helped us build exactly who we are and why it's important to know those things and to pass those traits on and it helped us build the identity of the family so um, in your academic studies, what, what have you learned that reinforces what you already knew as a kid? So I'll share several terms that help articulate it, but I think there's one quote that I've found that talks about carrying on the identity of organizations. And it's in a leadership book by Max Dupree, and it says, Every family, every university, every corporation, every institution needs tribal storytellers. The penalty for failing to listen is to lose one's history, one's historical context, and one's binding values. Without the continuity brought by custom, any group of people will begin to forget who they are. That's an important part of why we tell stories. In the organizations which we all belong to, whether it's at the university, at SUU, or in different cultures, different places, that's who, what helps build who we are. There are several terms. Identification is one of them. And identification is sharing stories to build the identity of an organization. If you think about the Marine Corps or Greek organizations or Southern Utah University, we share those stories that help share the, build the identity that we all share. Fantasy chaining is another term, and fantasy chaining builds, uses stories to chain us, sorry, uses stories to chain us together to bind the values and to share that common story to rise up 
for something. So fantasy chaining links us all together from past generations to future generations and helps us become what we are. There are also artifacts. So artifacts are the tangible pieces that help support the story. So in our case, it would be Old Sorrel's hobbles or Neil Bladen's stopwatch that we have, things like that that are passed down from generations that support the stories and that we look to as part of the fantasy chain that we have developed. Yeah, so let's get to that in just a minute. This, um, these stories that we have at Southern Utah University with Neil Bladen and a horse called Old Sorrel um, that really help us create this identity. But it's interesting that families uh, without stories tend to lose their connectedness. I, I think that's what you're saying. Families, organizations, everybody. Yeah, definitely. In the case of families, if you think about the next generation younger than me, and if I haven't told those stories or passed them on to them correctly, or even incorrectly, if I haven't passed them on, they don't have the identity connected back to the pioneers. They just have the stories of the generations that they knew. So they don't know where they come from or what stock they come from. And they kind of flounder in the world a little bit because they don't have the roots to go back to. They simply don't know their roots. Same thing with organizations. If you don't build the culture and people don't understand where we came from or where we're going to or why that's important, if we don't have that shared narrative, then they aren't able to be part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah, to what extent does pride um, come into this, that I'm really proud to be part of this organization because of all these stories, and I want to live up to those stories. Um, how does that How does that shape us? I think it's a large part of stories and why it's important. If you don't know the organization and you just come in and put your time in at work or at school or whatever the organization is and clock in, clock out, and you aren't part of something bigger, then you don't have the passion for what they're doing. You just are there for the paycheck or the degree or whatever you want out of that organization. You're there for the end result, but you aren't in love or passionate about what you are doing. And I think people are so much more successful when they have that shared passion and shared vision and shared identity, and that's what storytelling gives you. So my dad was a storyteller. When we would go camping and gather around the campfire, he always had these great stories. Mine too. Yeah, and I don't know what your dad's um, view of it was, but my dad didn't really care so much about the facts. Yeah, that's that's definitely my dad. (laughs) Big hunter, and there were always fish stories, deer stories, and the deer got bigger every story that there was, and the facts... (laughs) didn't ever matter. It was the fact that we were spending time together and building that identity and having fun listening to each of those stories. And I think we could all recite different stories that were supposed to be the same, but came up completely differently. But that's part of the fun. Well, that's kind of like a movie when you see it says inspired by true facts. (laughs) Right. And everyone has their own interpretation or their own frame and the way that they look at something based on what they're feeling like that day or their own perceptions. That's another communication theory that they talk about. And you interpret those facts based on your experience. I'm sure my brothers interpreted hunting stories vastly different than I did. I was feeling bad for Bambi and they were in the hunt. (laughs) They were victors. Yes. So do you think that, um, well, I, let me add this. So I was, um, reading recently about stories, uh, and it contrasted the European settlers to this continent and the Native Americans who were here, and the difference between the two in stories. The, the Cherokee, for example, thought it was odd that the Europeans had their stories written down because that kind of locked the stories into a, a narrative, whereas the Native um, Americans had the stories more fluid, and they 
they were there was a purpose for their stories and telling morals. And I'm I'm wondering if if accuracy is important or not and and are we becoming more accurate in our storytelling with the advent of the internet and more more ability to research out truth. I believe we have to become more accurate because people can Google it. And the stories that we used to tell as a family, my nephews will say, I call that that is not true and look it up right then. So the moral is lost. And I believe that's part of our culture is we get so stuck in the facts now that we have lost the culture of let's get to the moral. Sometimes stories were totally made up because it delivered the moral or the narrative for somebody to learn something. And it was a more interesting way to learn than just delivering the facts. It was something that they could remember. And I think that we have gotten lost in maybe the moral or the storytelling, and we're more into facts and delivering facts. And that we're losing some of the identity and the culture of storytelling because of that. I love this uh, story that I read, and I believe that it was uh, from the Cherokee. But this dad takes his son on a hike, and they go down a trail. And, of course, that's their that's where they go. They go down trails. That's how they travel from place to place. And as they're going down the trail, the father stops and points out a, what could be a shortcut and says to his son, this is the place where your great-grandmother or grandpa um, decided to disobey his mother and take a shortcut. And along the shortcut, got bit by a rattlesnake. And so remember to never take shortcuts and to always be obedient. See, great lesson learned. Yeah, so that's a story. And every time this child walks down that same path um, and, and goes past that spot, the story comes back. And it's the story that gives him the moral. It's the story that keeps that embedded in his mind because the story is more fixed for us. The story meant something, and the story was imaginative and interesting to a curious little boy. His dad very well could have said, hey, don't take shortcuts, it's bad. Would he have remembered that or had to hear it a lot of times? But he remembers the story of the rattlesnake and not taking shortcuts. I think stories embed in our memories a lot better. I know my dad worked on campus, and I will often hear from his students When I had a problem, your dad would always get in the truck and take us to the mountains and tell us a lot of stories, and I would work through those on my own. And they will always begin with one story, or he told us a story. And it meant a lot more to them, not only because of the time he was spending, but because of the lesson that they learned, much like you're talking about. Yeah, and and maybe the story changes over time, but there's always a purpose to it. Right. The story usually helps teach something or will help them remember something better. And it's important to our culture. It builds the identity. And a lot of the great teachers use allegories and stories, Aesop, and Jesus Christ. And yeah. they, they, they used stories so that people would remember um, whether, whether or not that thing actually happened was sort of beside the point. The, the point was remember this moral. Yeah, whether or not there was a good Samaritan, in, in fact. Um, I don't know that we really think about that. I just think we think of here's the moral, and, and we remember the moral because of the story. The lessons, they're a lot more interesting and engaging when there's a story behind it. Yeah, the story of Santa Claus. <laughs> what? Be, be good or else. That's, That's not... Right. You, you <laughs> just blew my childhood right there. <laughs> well, so... Um, Let's bring this to today and to Southern Utah University. And every single organization has or should have stories like this. But I think that Southern Utah University perhaps has one of the best stories. I think we have the best founding story out there. Not that I've researched every institution, but we certainly have the grit and determination and everything that you need to make a story interesting. So you've been around... Um, Southern Utah University a lot longer than Steve or I. Um, Since I was born. Since you were born, Mm because your dad worked here. My dad worked on campus. My grandma attended back in 1918. 
We d- it's been carried on as part of the generations. They were even part of the founding families. When did the founding story um, of Southern Utah University become important? I believe that it's always been important to those who were there and those who lived it, passed it on to their children. I don't know that it became a shared identity until we had Jerry Sherritt, a former president who was an alumnus, bring it back up again because it was his relatives again who had been part of the founding. And he brought it up in the 70s and 80s. I remember my grandparents talking about it in the 70s, but Jerry did his dissertation on it and spent a lot of time bringing it back to the public view. And I think since the 80s, it's really helped form who we are and shaped that identity. So where does, um, where does our story begin? Back in 1897. Clear back then? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> That's right. 1897. There is a contest because the University of Utah is going to create a branch campus somewhere in southern Utah, and all of these small communities become competitors to win the right to have this school. And um, where does it go from there? You're a good storyteller. I was totally into (laughs) that right there. we We can go back and forth a little bit on this story. It's a great story, and and uh, it has different focus. I think that the story is generally accurate, but for different people who tell it, they focus on different pieces of the story, depending on what moral they're trying to tell or what image they're trying to create. Um. But this is a community of 1,200 farmers, ranchers, and miners. And they've only been living here for a couple decades. Uh, Cedar City was settled, what year, Mindy, do you remember? Oh, I don't know that off the top of my head. We could Google it back to facts. They've only been here for a few decades, and it's still a frontier town. They're still focused on ranching and mining farming, all those kinds of things. Survival. Survival. Yeah, they're still in the survival mode. Survive. And when this contest comes up, there that the condition that was given was that the town had to donate land and build on that land a school according to the exacting specifications of the state legislature. But the people in Cedar City didn't have money to build this, and they didn't have materials. This is still a frontier town, and all of the materials had been used to build a church building called Ward Hall. And so they made this assumption that, you know, maybe they'll just let us start school in Ward Hall, and then eventually we'll build a schoolhouse. Um, but on January 1st, um, 1898, the city, the town learns that if they don't build the school according to the requirements, by the time school starts that coming fall, eight months, that the school is going to be taken away from them and given to another town, that their hope that the, this church house would work uh, didn't. And, uh, and so... They try to figure out what to do, and, and the, the difficulty is they don't have any materials, and they've got to start building this in the winter. And where do you get lumber? Where do you get bricks? Where do you get stones to build a foundation in the dead of winter? They didn't have any of that. It wasn't easily attainable. They didn't have it in their backyards, and they were devastated, I believe. So they knew there was a um, sawmill up on the Mammoth, more than 10,000 feet above sea level, way up in the mountain, that had some lumber there, and they thought, well, maybe this is the way to get started. There wasn't a fraction of the lumber they needed at the sawmill, but, but that's something, you know, it's something that they can do. And so four days after learning about this problem, a group of 11 men and 22 horses, for the first time in their lives, head up the mountain in the winter. They had never been up there. 
So they were ill-prepared. They didn't know what was going to fall them, befall them. And uh, five days, that seems so long to me, five days into this journey, and they still haven't accomplished their mission, and this snowstorm hits. And I, you know, all these stories that we have in Utah about the early settlers, they all seem to start the same way. There was a century <laughs> big yes, storm. <laughs> blizzard of the century. <laughs> And and we don't know if this was the century of the blizzard, but century the blizzard of the century, but but that's the way the story goes, is that this was the storm of the century. That's part of what enhances it. If it wasn't the truth, then that's part of what enhances the story. But we know there was snow and it was a blizzard. Yeah, and it's the way Jerry Sherritt, former president Sherritt, tells the story. There's eleven horses. No, twenty two horses. Twenty two horses. Eleven, 11 men. men. 22 horses, and of all the horses, when they get up on the top of the mammoth, the, the horses can't break through these massive snowdrifts that have been formed in this blizzard, except for one, and once one horse uh, who they called Old Sorrel, an eight-year-old, 1,600-pound draft horse. Massive horse. Yeah. Is able to break through the drifts and... The way Jerry used to tell the story, it was it was uh, the story focused on this horse and how amazing the horse was to be able to paw at the drifts and then sit down and pant and then paw some more and sit down and pant and just keep going. You you um, grew up with horses, Mindy, and anybody that knows horses knows they don't like being in thick snow. No, they snow. don't. It's just uh, it's hard for them. It's harder for horses probably in deep snow than it is for people. But they get through that, they find their way back to this uh, little cabin and spend the night and they've got to figure out what to do. And um, During the night, uh, four more people come up from town, so now there's 15, 15 in this little cabin and they just, they're tired, they're hungry, they're cold, they're wet, they're in this blizzard. Frustrated. Frustrated, yeah. I think that's probably where I would land is frustrated and not sure how we were going to get out of that. The whole town's depending on them, but but um, as Jerry Sherritt tells the story, the they barely escaped with their lives. Um, and um, I don't know if that's an overstatement or not, but but for a bunch of settlers that uh, are unfamiliar with the mountains in the winter, had never been up there before, it it's probably more accurate than sometimes we give it credit for. And you know what I love about it is each family who has passed it down has their own addition to it. They're not embellishing, but they'll talk about their great-grandfather did this, or their great-grandfather did this while this was happening, or they survived with one match, or old Sorrel, the only reason he was able to do that is he was lost as a young horse and had to climb out of a canyon to get himself free. And if you think about how all of that happened, and if that hadn't happened when he was a young horse, would he have known how to get out of the snowdrift, or would he have had the skills? It's just interesting how each family brings their own piece and how important this story is as a whole to the organization, but to each of those families who participated in it. Yeah, and it is amazing that that a horse was able to plow its way through, paw its way through these huge snowdrifts and uh, free a space that everybody could could get through. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on mountains in the snow, and it's it can be a little nervous. And, and um, when I go up there, I have Gore-Tex and snowshoes and all this kind of stuff. These, right. these people didn't have any of that. They don't have any of that, and they weren't prepared, as prepared as they should have been, And it's almost a miracle. In fact, it is a miracle that they were able to get through, and it was the power of that horse. But we can't forget the people. Yeah. So now we're, we're what, five, uh, four or five days before they're able to start up the mountain, and now we're about six days into the mountain journey. And uh, they're in this little uh, teeny cabin, uh, and it's morning, trying to decide what to do. They've escaped with their lives so far. Some think that the only thing to do is to just get out while they can because the storm's not over. 
They've been scared, understandably. And they have this uh, argument, and, and uh, a leader emerges. Um, the leader is Neil Bladen. And Neil Bladen's descendants and uh, family members are still in town. and They are, and they're very proud of what he did. I've always heard Cornelius Bladen, and I've heard Neil Bladen, and I didn't know they were the same person. <laughs> It, it struck me when we were doing the documentary, oh, Neil Bladen was Cornelius Bladen, but Neil Bladen, Thomas Bladen, and the Bladen family is still here, and their roots run deep. Yeah. So that morning, they all get up. They're talking about what to do. Um, they know that this... There's, there's a few things they know, and one is is that many people in the community have mortgaged their homes to pay for the teachers' salaries. Yes. Mortgages their homes, ranches, sheep, everything they could to get this paid for. Um, but some of them think that it's impossible. And so at the end of this discussion, they part ways. Five of them stay up on the mountain. The rest go down. And the five return back up to get the lumber. Uh, and that's kind of where um, the story starts to slide from these people into the rest of the community that that Neil Bladen leads this small group. They go up, they get the lumber. Again, it's an insignificant amount of lumber. This is one wagon load of lumber. But they haul it down into town, and when they arrive with as few boards as they had, it ignited a community. Jubilation. I think it was the motivation that everyone needed that this was possible and that they could do it, and the sacrifice was great. Let's not let the sacrifice go to waste. Yeah, so now we find ourselves with women and men digging clay out of the cold earth to form and fire bricks to build it. We've got people going up, um, quarrying rocks for the foundation. Um, That one load of lumber wasn't nearly enough, so the whole community is pulling together, finding everything they can to fashion better sleds, uh, better clothes. The image in my mind, Mindy, is uh, this image of the entire town, 1,200 people total. So that would be a small number of families, actually, um, with everybody having some commitment in it, leaving their farms, leaving their their minds, whatever they've got going to, to pull together because they've got a fuse. They have to get it done. And Cedar City has always had that spirit. I think this exemplifies it more than any other story. Everyone pulled together and got it done. The women, the children, the men, everyone had something to do with it. I look at my great-grandfather, and he owned the tack shop in town and made blankets. He and his family made blankets for the horses. And there are story after story of what everyone in the community contributed. And everyone played an important part of that. And that's part of the culture that we pass on today. That's why I think that we see this story, Steve and Mindy, as being one of the best organizational stories of all. Because when I arrived here at Southern Utah University just over four years ago, everybody that I met was... And it was my great-grandfather that mortgaged his house. Mm -hmm. And it was my great-great-grandmother that did this. And it was my... That gave their casket wood or that baked for the expedition or whatever it is. Right. Everyone had a piece of that story. It tied everybody together. It did. And because of that, our community has a deep love for SUU and a commitment to it because everyone can say it was my great-great-grandmother or grandfather or whatever piece it was. Everybody has a piece of it. Yeah, so when times get hard or tough, uh, we bring the story back to remind everybody that we too can go back up the mountain, that we too can, can push ourselves a little harder because somebody did it before us, and we can do it today. It's a rallying cry for our community that we can all get together and we can push through difficult times or difficult things to make this happen, but together. That's the importance of building the cultural identity, is we do it together and we take each other along, not one person goes out and does their thing. 
I loved in your inauguration speech that you focused on back up the mountain. We'd all heard the story previously, but you focused on the group that went back up the mountain or that continued on through the journey. And that's something that we can do and how we can move forward. And I love that that was a focus of yours because it taught an entirely different lesson. So I guess, um, yeah, but it is a fun lesson, isn't it? Well, it's a great lesson. And there are thousands of lessons in each and every part of that story, depending on what you're listening to or what you need to learn or what you want to take out of it, your interpretation. So many different lessons. I guess part of the moral of this story of morals is that <laughs> um, we all need to develop these stories. And, and if there's uh, if we're part of an organization, if we're part of a family, if we're part of some, some group that has a common purpose or mission, that we need to find a way to pull us together and create the motivation. So for every organization, there needs to be something. The stories are what bind us together and build the culture that people can believe in and buy into and that motivate them to do more than just the regular job or the regular part of school that they're trying to do. Stories increase the success of organizations and make you want to be a part of the bigger organization. I guess we don't need to say how important stories are to us as a people because we've got Look at uh, our history. Millions and millions of dollars made every year on movies and books and songs that are all stories. That's right. They're all stories. So do what do we do to to help our students understand and value these these types of stories? Do we uh, we spend a, a fair amount of time and effort to make them um, available? We've we've produced a film. Uh, about the story of uh, Back Up the Mountain. Um, we had a visiting Chinese art scholar uh, that's right. who painted a picture of the founding story with Chinese watercolors on silk, giving a slightly different interpretation of it. That's Mindy, you work with alumni a lot. Right. Is, 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 it, is it those stories that keep them connected and... And keep them connected to one another and to the institution. It they, definitely their shared is. experiences. It definitely is. And alumni have heard this story for decades and generations. And the alumna that is that graduated in the 1950s has the same shared narrative as the students graduating now. So it brings them back together, and they love the organization because of what they share. It is critical that our students understand where they came from and what they can accomplish because of our founders. But we don't just rest on that story. We use it to propel our students forward. I've been beating this drum and we're doing much better at sharing the story with our alumni and with our students and finding whatever lesson they need in that story at the moment. But as they come on campus as freshmen, we build this narrative for them. And we share that narrative, and it weaves them into the fabric of SUU. From that 1897 to the alumni in the 50s, 60s, 70s, to their parents, who are often alumni now, to them. And they are part of the legacy, and they want to work to carry that legacy on, and not just check in, check out, go to class. They want to carry that legacy on, and that is what propels a lot of our students into becoming great alumni that are contributing and having an impact where they are. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University. Our in-studio guest has been Mindy Benson, the vice president at SUU for alumni and community relations. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.